everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today is an exciting day because we have a guest with us who says that she went up to heaven when she was at a shopping mall and it was cut short. Then years later, she went back where she left off. She saw something miraculous that you're going to want to hear. And then she's going to share with us something that God spoke to her that broke her heart. Tanya Ward from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and share this important message with each and every one of you. Tanya, well, let's start off. First, were you always a believer? I was never a, a Christian. I wasn't a Christian. I always believed in God as such. I always believed I was a good person. Um, never did I think that I was a sinner. I never even had conviction of sin, but I did have a, an inner knowing that some things I couldn't do. I had an icky feeling if I would smoke or so. So relatively to the world's eyes, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't cuss. So to the big sins, I, I believe Father God was calling me out. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So growing up, were your parents agnostic, atheists? Were they believers? Were they not believers? They were more religious. See, my father was brought up in Ireland and he was forced into um, a religion. So he was told to go to church and he would get in trouble if he didn't go to church every Sunday. So he would say, I didn't really want to bring my children up that they could have a choice. And then my mother was is Ukrainian and she was more orthodox. So we went to church Christmas and Easter and so forth. But, you know, we sell Jesus on the wall, but we would pray our father who art in heaven. Um, but we didn't know any more than that. Yeah, it was more fear based. You know, we, we taught about the devil is on the left and God is on the right. You know, a lot of superstition, a lot of that. My mom, beautiful hearted, but you know you know yeah. and she would taught us to pray but um yeah that's all I thought would be to go to heaven you know and I'd measure myself to mostly everybody else, and that's how my measure of justice was yeah. now how about your grandparents you said your grandparents were into some odd things too yeah like my grandfather my diddle he was in the war and sometimes you know even when he was out in um, fighting, he would see a vision of a, of a ghost and it lured him, you know, to follow. It was a, a silhouette of a, a lustful woman. And um, so he, he would follow her and it, he ended up in a swamp. So obviously it was saint and trying. So it's a little bit of, you know, I'm not sure if you would say witchcraft, but it was about, you know, not praying to the dead, but you know what I'm saying? Things like that, you know, supernatural experiences. And when I was younger and um, I saw this man come over our back fence and I could see him, it was solid form, and then he went translucent. And I ran into the house, I think I was only five or six, and I'd say to Mum, Mum, I saw something, an intruder come in, but then he vanished. And she goes, oh, don't worry, that's just your grandfather coming um, in spirit form because he just died six months ago and he was supposed to be here. So that's what we were brought up with, so that super, you know, you know, demonic. -y. You said your brother, he got involved with some not so yeah. things also. What happened there? So he would always dabble and would always, you know, watch a little bit of scary movies and stuff like that. And then my brother would, you know, get us all together and say, hey, let's do a seance. So we did a seance once and it was oh, so scary. I, we could see the actual cup move and everything. And then from that day, there was a real uneasiness when I walked into his bedroom, maybe because he was the instigator. I'm not sure. But he would tell me, we didn't know at the time, but he would actually levitate from his bed. And um, he would have a lot of rolling thoughts, fast thoughts. He didn't have a lot of peace in his mind. And then sometimes he would hear voices tell him, go into the kitchen, get a knife and kill your mum and dad. Now, right then and here, we didn't know about the enemy. He didn't know about the enemy. He was struggling with a lot of dizziness and he was a golf, he wanted to be a golf professional and he'd go out and play golf, but it would sabotage all of this anxiety would come. So anyways, the dad took him to doctors and so forth. But he would go to the psychiatrist, he would go everywhere to try and find, he went to work one day and this 
guy that he worked with, which was one of my neighbours, surprisingly. It's amazing how God puts everything. And he said, have you tried Jesus? And he goes, well, ta- well, to be honest, I've tried everything. No, I've tried Jesus. What do you mean try Jesus? Is he in the churches? No, no, no. You need to be born again. And he said, do you know that those thoughts that you're thinking are not from you? There's an external source. It's the enemy. Demons can dart information into your own brain and you perceive it as your own thoughts. And he wants to wear you down. Ultimately, he wants to take your life. He comes to kill, steal and destroy. And he wants you obviously to take your own life and take other people's life. And anyway, so my brother hearing this for the first time at work he was a concrete at the time my brother's done multiple jobs and he fell to the ground and he just humbled it and he just accepted Jesus so from that moment he had peace and so that was his journey he came and shared his testimony with the family and we're going oh that's great Dan good for you you know and then I was in and out or um a relationship um this was after my divorce I had eight years on my own with my beautiful son and I said to myself, oh, I don't really need a partner. And But anyway, I, I was love bombed by a narcissist. As, you know, at the time, you know, you don't know you're going into, you know, a lesson and so forth. And then to get out of that relationship, I become a yoga teacher. And so with my brother knowing about Christianity and how the enemy works, I became a yoga teacher and he came up to me and he said, Tanya, Tanya, did you know that you're teaching antichrist. So all these people that are into your care and coming into your room, you're luring them away from God. And I said, no, are you serious? I think I'm doing good. I'm trying to heal my heart. You know, I wasn't a Christian. I'm healing my heart after a narcissist abuse. And you're telling, so I got offended because the word of God does offend. And I said, so you're saying that I'm going to hell? That's what I felt. And he said, Tanya, I said, would God forgive me? He goes, Tanya, I don't know. And then I just felt this real, I was convicted. So anyway, I, we didn't really talk about it. I said, look, I don't want to talk about your Jesus anymore. And I was quite offended. And that was my journey of, um, you know, he, that was a seed planted in my heart, you know. And this is why it's important to tell the truth because we've been brought up with a lot of lies and then God can work on that truth. And he was In my heart, I just didn't have peace. So then when I was doing the yoga, to be honest, this inner knowing that I had this pride spirit in me and I'd always pray to God even though I wasn't born again. What is this in me? I felt puffed up. And when people would come in instantly to hear my meditation voice and to, you know, calmly soothe them, because it wasn't just meditation. I love the spiritual side of the yoga. So that's where it was demonic, if you know what I'm saying. So it was all kundalini energy and it was all chakras and stuff like that, um, which is really big in the world now because you don't know that you're actually invoking demons when you're doing the OM and all of that, yeah? So that was what my brother was warning me about, the spiritual you know, repercussions of this practice. So Tanya, you mentioned that the word of God does offend. Some people watching <laughs> that may have never heard that before or don't understand it. Could you explain that? I was so offended. I want you to know that I said to my brother, I can no longer speak to you anymore. Um, I don't want to see you for now. Um, I was so hurt because what you understand, we're relying on all our feelings in this world. We're relying on all our strength and we want support from our family. And when a Christian says that, they're saying that from protection of your soul. I didn't know that. So I needed my brother to support me from the narcissist. I've just been through narcissist abuse, a man. I wanted him to say, oh, that's great, Tan. You know, yoga's great. Good on you. You're doing your best. But no, he stood on the word of God and he could see me go down the wrong path. So in retrospect, after two years of not seeing him, I really felt convicted no, it's breaking my mum and dad's heart. I want to see you again. Let's all get together. But I said to him, let's not talk about Jesus. He said, absolutely. So when we got together at Family Affairs, we talked about, we didn't talk about, we just loved. So he saw me get down on the floor with Lego, playing Lego with his children. And I said to him, thank you, you know, Daniel. And I could see this love and forgiveness in him that I didn't see in anybody else. And that changed my heart. And then we... um 
I was, I'm a hairdresser and I talk to people. And even before I was, when I was divorced with my first husband, I'd always be on a journey where we go after we die. So I'd always, you know, read these books of, you know, near-death experiences and stuff. It's really important to have that seed because um, as a hairdresser, I'd talk to people and really like their stories and listen to them and help them. So this one particular lady came in and she shared with me, see in yoga, you need to shed the emotions to get to peace. Now, this lady, she was broken. Her husband passed away and she was telling me how much she loved him. Her, I was crying with her. She was crying. And what happened was she said to me, she goes, if it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. I'd be in my room in the dark, totally like not existing. And I felt this darkness and I felt this peace that she had with Jesus. And I've always seen people that talk about Jesus but known apart from my brother um, in the churches as this distant God and they would be hypocrites. They weren't really kind and loving, right? So that made me go down the yoga path. But this particular lady, she had this peace. And as I'm drying her hair, I could feel this peace, tangible peace, which was different than the yoga teachers that I had. So without question, she had more peace in her brokenness where we were taught in the brokenness, you can't reach peace. So this was twisting totally. Everything I taught was taught in the yoga Sanskrits. So this was me seeking truth. And I didn't really, wasn't sold out to yoga because I was just even feeling a little bit of pride coming to me as I talked. But this lady, innocent, had more peace than these yogis. So that got me on, I um, took a mental note and I said, if I ever need help in this world, I'm going to call out to that lady's Jesus. But if my brother didn't warn me, I would have thought, oh, God is good. Your Jesus is good. My God is good that I had because, you know. But the, it's important to know that he is the only way, the truth and the life, that we need to get that out. Without him, we can't get through to the Father. He died on that cross for our sin debt that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And and that's what my brother was telling me without saying it. So God will give us layman's terms how to talk to people, not religious spirits that makes them go away and it puffs up the preacher, but it's not reaching that soul. So Tanya, what do you say about Christians? Because I know I've experienced this many times where, you know, I and, you know, a few members of our team would educate it would educate people about yoga who are in yoga, yet they're professed Christians and they'll always defend it. Or they'll say, you know, well, this certain position is the only thing that helps my back. Or, mm. you know, I do it and I think about Jesus. So it's not bad. Or, you know, I can do Jesus and yoga. What do mm. you say about that? There's a spirit that comes over you when through the teacher. And, you know, I believe you got to keep your eye gates and your ear gates pure because it's we're so susceptible to this energy and we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And the more that you mature, you wouldn't even want to be in that environment. And especially to a young, vulnerable believer, there's so much that can be spoken over you in the spirit realm. And um, when I did come to Jesus, these demons were coming out of my chest that I got being the yoga teacher. I saw them and I saw these black images and they were talking to me and they were trying to steal my faith as soon as I went to heaven. Um, they were trying. So you need to be around positive, um, keep everything on the goodness of God. Um, why would you want to go to the enemy's camp, you know, and collectively people see and you'll be held accountable to if that Christian does it, we all can do it. Um, and then they've got the om. So that om creates a spiritual and you wouldn't want to do anything to, to tarnish you and take away your light because we do have a light in this world and it's um, a light that others need to see in the darkness because there needs to be hope. It's a different light. It's a different light, the yoga. Yeah. So Tanya, take us to this day because this happened in two parts, but let's start with the first part. Take us to the part where you were at the shopping mall and you're up in heaven. Next thing you know, you're in heaven. Yeah. 
And I really know what the rapture is going to feel like because I was taken out of my body and whooshed right up, like, to heaven. And Wait, so how did um, it happen? So how did it start off? Praying to God. And God promises, and we've got to know his promises. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And I was asking, what is life all for when I divorced my husband? This was back 28 um, years ago. Um I was always wondering, oh, this marriage failed, but holding my baby boy for the first time was the greatest love. And that was my search for God and what all happens. Because when you have your baby for the first time, that love is immense. And you know that we didn't come from a supernatural force, you know, the big bang. You just know that there's more to life. Um, so I was always praying and um, I did see a demon when I first divorced with with when I was had Jordan in um, I was all alone in a unit and um, so I was always seeking so anyway this one particular time and God answers our prayers we never know he's such a good God and we never know when he's going to answer our prayers so I was in the middle of a shopping center our local shopping center which I worked in I was on my lunch break just talking to a friend and the next minute I was taken up out of my body like wish it was like I couldn't feel um the speed of light I couldn't feel it like my hair wasn't going everywhere but it was so intense and I knew I was getting a force lifted me up and then I found myself in the throne of God and I was so exalted I was going wow like all these pillars and gold and everything and father God or God was on his throne you don't know I didn't see his face he it was majesty and it was golden and it was pure love, right? But it was love, joy, peace, protection. And all eyes were on me and I was exalted. And I just thought I was just in awe. And I was just thinking, wow. And then I came back down to my body. And I didn't know what that was about. And I was talking to the person after that and he, the person was looking at me as if to say, waiting for me to talk. So obviously they asked me a question, which I forgot. So anyway, so I wasn't drinking, smoking. I wasn't in a dream. I was standing in a shopping centre taken up to heaven. So I was on a journey. I went back to work and I said to a, I had a Christian at work and I had people around me and they were saying, Tanya, Tanya, what's happened to you? You're glowing. You look fantastic. Are you in love? And I said, I've just been to heaven and the love. So anyway, I um, would ask people and I went to churches and I asked the person at work and he goes, come to my church. You know, it was a Pentecostal church, a Christian church. And, yeah, my pastor will answer any questions that you have. So we went to the church and I was saying about my vision. And straight away I got a really bad feeling, like icky in my gut. And he said, what do you think you are, Apostle Paul? And I said, oh, he goes, look, you know, de the devil gives visions as well. And um, those visions have ceased, you know. Um, and I, I just thought, well, I wasn't really, like, from the devil. I, and I just was so condemned. And he goes, look, we're all going to pray over you. He got me up in front of everybody in the church and prayed deliverance on me. And I wasn't a Christian. He didn't tell me about the cross. He didn't tell me the love of Jesus. He didn't tell me that was the could have been you know well, I know it was the right throne judgment now but he didn't even say that what he said was um yeah that I had you know maybe had a demon and condemned me and but I did remember when he did pray on me when they did pray I felt a peace so then but then I still didn't like what he said so then I just felt I went to another church and they couldn't answer me you know do you think that you're a prophet you know, only the prophets had visions from, from God, you know. And anyway, so then I thought, oh, I'm so disheartened. What did I see? I know it was real and so forth. And then as a, as a hairdresser, a client came in and she goes, Tanya, she goes, my friend is a, is a soul reader. She interprets dreams and visions and she, um, she will want to do a reading on you. Would you like that? And I said, oh, absolutely. So I went to her and she said, look, you you and your son are angelic from the angelic realm and um, you're here to ground love and light and moral conduct. And um, so that was you know, your visitation from heaven and, you know, and I was sold, you know, the enemy. 
totally, totally. I always just thought, yep, that sounds right. You know, I feel that I'm a good person and my son's a beautiful soul. We're an angelic realm. We're here to, to ground love and light. Without you, this world is going to go to darkness. Yeah, so for 20 odd years, I believed that. And um, that's what made me go into metaphysics. I went into the yoga um, and I'd always believe that love was anything and just try and be a good person. And never did I think that I was going to go to hell. Never did I think that um, beyond that point. And, you know, beyond that point, Jesus wanted me to seek and keep seeking, you know. And yeah. Well, you know, before we get to that part, um, you said something interesting, Tanya. You said that. Basically, the churches didn't believe you, whether it was jealousy, whether it was pride, um, you know, like one pastor said to you, who do you think you are? The Apostle Paul. But the devil was able to hijack that and That's right. confuse you okay. and turn it around to basically say it was some new age craziness. But you mentioned that you told them that you saw the white throne judgment. So could you go into detail as to what you did see? So when I went to heaven the first time, this is what I saw. I had, they had all like panel of judges, right? And it was like a semicircle, like a court of law. So it had authority. So for the first time, I said to myself, finally, we have authority, proper authority. Our governments aren't, you know, and I felt peace, joy. And then I look around and then these men were like probably 20 of them, but the Bible says 24. and um, they all had golden crowns all had, with long white robes and then they had books. All oh, each and every one of these men had a book in front of them like this and they were all looking at me. So I felt like so important. I felt like I'm going to be rewarded, you know, because at this point you've got to understand I wasn't a Christian. I didn't even think I was a sinner. So I thought these things contained in these books were everything I ever did on earth, right, so for my rewards. So, and I'm just in awe looking around and, you know, Jesus wasn't there. I saw, fa see, Father God, God on his throne and looking down over this courtroom. And then I was taken back down to my body in the shopping centre. So that's as far as the vision got. So I saw these men with golden crowns with long white robes. I didn't know about the book of Revelation. I didn't know the 24 elders on the 24 thrones and the books were open. And this is what this pastor should have told me, you know, I don't understand. But look, you know, a lot of churches are deceived, teaching, you know, a lot of falsehoods, you know. They go into theologian degrees and they're not listening to Jesus's words, you know. Um, yeah, so that was profound so that was on the journey of trying to interpret that vision so that was my mission and I knew that and um, Jesus didn't tell me that but he gave me a little bit and it's up to us to seek and if you seek for righteousness you will be fulfilled you know we've got to seek with all our heart and so that was me and I fell into the enemy's um lies because the enemy lies he's such a good liar so he'll use anything to deceive us. And even Jesus says, you know, many, many times, do not be deceived. Yeah, and that's where this lady, she was into metaphysics. She was into soul, star seeds, they're called, um, twin flames and all of this. This is what is happening now in our world. It's a new age, you know, so which got me onto the new age path. So then I would measure myself to others like, yeah, I'm still going to heaven. Yeah, you've got religion. That's great. Whatever way. And I really believe there was many ways to heaven at this point. Yeah. Wow. And you know what? You said something that was really interesting is stuck with me from the first time I spoke to you. You said, Jesus doesn't like it when his visions are misinterpreted. What do you mean yeah. by that? I love that. Okay. So when you're with Jesus, he really talks deep into your heart and um, he really doesn't like it when his visions are misinterpreted. So when I was with him, it was like so strong within Jesus. He had to get to the truth of the matter. It was so important to him beyond words my words can even say. He is truth, is truth personified, and he doesn't like it when we um, are fed lies. So that's when he took me back with the second vision, he took me back up to heaven and he showed me the real interpretation of that vision. And he was standing there with his long white robe and it's like a reenactment 
of that same vision and the truth. And anything I I had time to ask questions and he would answer them. He would answer me in words and he would answer me in telepathy and he'd answer me in heart-to-heart communication. The deepest form of communication with Jesus is heart-to-heart. And this is why it's so important that we humble ourselves because he gives grace to the humble and open our hearts where this world closes our heart. And a lot of religion don't believe in their heart. They always talk about the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. But we would need to ground our will to the Father's will. And, um, you know, I see a lot of religious people that are cold-hearted, actually. They're so scared to use their heart. But if we are love, we're a sounding gong, Jesus says, um, without loving our enemies, we will not make it in this life. We have to have fervent love for everybody. And we need to know it's not our love, it's his love in us and the truth. We worship him in love, in truth and um, in the spirit in truth and um, he's the spirit and the truth is his word. And um, we need to work out our salvation with the fear and trembling. And, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. He, how he communicates and he does, like, you know, you were asking, he doesn't like lies and he loves the truth, you know, especially when we're deceived. And there's been many of you pulled me back through, you know, and, and any way he can come to us, even if he has to show us how to save us, um, where we're going down the wrong path, he will. So the second time you went to heaven, that was years later, but a lot happened in between that gap. And you met someone who you mentioned became a narcissist and you learned a whole lot and things begin to progress in a different direction. Could you, could you share with us what happened in between that gap between the first time you went to heaven and the second time when it actually continued? What happened with this ex and what happened with your daughter? So the second time I, I was with my son for eight years and totally on this spiritual path, I was on that spiritual journey with um, my son. And I always thought I don't need to have a partner and, and then just knowing I was um, told that I'm on, on this angelic realm, grounding love and light, and my son and I were grounding love and light. <clears throat> then I was a hairdresser and I met this gentleman and um, he just said, oh, you're an angel. I've never really heard anyone, do you know what I mean? And I just fell love bombed, you know. And um, <clears throat> and um, see, at that point, um I was so in love and, you know, people would say, oh, that's great, that's great. But um, after a few months, what happened was, and I just said to, I didn't really want another child, I didn't want to be a single mother again. And um, and this is me not running him down. I've got forgiveness for him now. I want people to know this. But I want it to be honest because narcissists are real. And um, he was great to me. I did see some signs of ag- aggression, but I thought that's all right. So I did want to back away from him. So at this time, um, I actually became pregnant. And this is the first time I've ever felt evil before and seen it. And he said to me, um, as soon as I said, I'm pregnant, I can't believe I'm pregnant. And he, he turned around and the demon spoke out of him. He said, good, I have you. I need your light. You're having that baby. And then I just said, oh. Okay, and then from that moment, I just thought, look, I need to get away from him. And then it was just that was the whole journey of seeing um, how people can be taken over by demons. And this is where Father God teaches us, you know, it is not the person, it's the per- it's the demon that this person has chosen to follow to get them out of their pain. So then... um. I would hear Sanisha was born, beautiful, and, you know, it, we did the best that we could and I humbled myself towards her father, making sure that she would be brought up well. And then sometimes I would, you know, hear noises in the in um, the lounge room that he would get angry. Now, he had a lot of unforgiveness and a lot of hurt from his upbringing. And sometimes I'd see him go into a rage. And then one particular time I was just reading a, a book in my bedroom and he would, you know, be stomping on the floor. And this particular time it was just watching a, a football match. The umpire didn't make a right decision. And he just got so aggressive and he wanted to stand, stomp on the umpire's head. And I've just come in and I said, what's all the confuffle? I thought there was an intruder or something into the home, you know. And this is why we've got to understand that 
murder is real and um, domestic violence is real. And I want people to know that um, the enemy wants to take um, families apart and he wants to take many people to hell through unforgiveness. Um, so he, I want people to know that he wasn't a Christian. God still has his laws. He had a lot of unforgiveness and hurt. Um, his dad, they used to fight, even fist fight. So this one particular time, and it happened a few times, he would um, animate to try and pretend to punch this umpire. So what he would do, he was punching the umpire and he was grabbing the umpire in the head, like animating and animating having a knife. And this is the only thing that I can explain that this would happen in, in hell, this demonic possession. I saw his eyes turn black. I didn't see actual demons, but I saw his eyes turn black and he animated taking off an arm and arm and a leg and a leg and stabbing continuously into the torso, taking off the head and holding up the head like a gladiator in the gladiator days I was absolutely shocked now God spoke to me in this time I want everyone to know even though you're not a believer God the father God is calling us out towards Jesus every time so he was to keep me safe and you know what God said to me I want you to watch I want you to take a mental note of what's transpiring so anyway he this happened and he held the head up like a gladiator and I did not I knew God said be loving do not say anything you don't want to end up in the middle of that right this is why a lot of women do not fight back you know you need to love our enemies you know anyway so God said to me I want you to go up to to Sean now and ask just what happened in his eyes so he's gone to the couch and he's fallen down and he's tired and he goes, I said, hey, Sean, I'm in the bedroom. I'm reading my book and I heard all this yelling and screaming. I thought an intruder came in. Hey, Matt, buddy, are you okay? And if God didn't speak to me, I wouldn't be able to speak to him like that. I would have gone, you need help, go to therapy. And that's what happens, okay? So this is what we do. We judge the person. So, but God said, no, be loving and ask him. So I've asked him, I said, Sean, I said, what happened over there? I've asked him permission to share this testimony. So back the day, I knew I'm going to be sharing this one day because this is going to help many people. So I've actually asked his permission to share this. So this is really profound. This is very important <clears throat> that we need to love our enemies because the enemy is the devil. Anyway, so he's on the couch flat out. So exhausted. Hey, Shawnee, I said, what happened? He goes, oh, Tan, he goes, I was so angry at the umpire and I wanted to punch his guts in, you know, where Aussies, Oz, that's how Aussies talk. And then just jumping on the ground, so frustrated because I wanted to really play footy and, you know, I didn't really make the cut. And, you know, that's an Aussie, yeah. And he goes, before I knew it, I felt this heavy energy come over me, really pushing me, and then I blacked out and then I found myself on the couch. Amen. Then and there, I knew, I knew, I knew. So that was my first teaching on Jesus, show, Father God was showing me. And then, um, yeah, wow, profound, profound experience. So he had no idea about the lust of killing and, and that stabbing. So that demon took his body over that day. Wow. See, murderers, you know, sometimes when people interview murderers, they have a real hate for a person, but do they really want to kill to that extreme? Some people do, but um, that lust only comes from a demon. He, that demon had so much lust as he was killing that animating person. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, from that moment, I um, knew that this person wasn't coherent, you know. So I, I just found a time that was safe to leave and um, and be with my daughter by myself, and and that's what and that's what we did. So she was five when I left, and everything was fine. But it was really hard to mentally get away because he needed my light, obviously, and that's what narcissists do. They need you, your supply, they call it, um, and it's a dopamine hit for them. So they, yeah, so they've got a lot of pain within themselves, you know, and God's got me to give him a lot of love now and um, he saw, saw it in my eyes actually. But that's another thing we can share as well that he noticed when I came to Jesus. He said, your eyes are really kind, you're different now. Wow. And that's a lot for narcissists to say, right? Because you said he even apologized when you gave yeah. him to Jesus, which is huge yeah. for Okay. You know what? You said something to me earlier that I heard probably once or twice before and how basically they said that when a person commits acts that are heinous 
um, or atrocious, the majority of the time they're possessed by a demon. Could you share with us what you told me about what happened to your mother? Oh, yes. Yeah. My mother, when she was 14 or 15, I can't remember the exact age. Um, we're from Ukraine, mum's from Ukraine. So they were displaced people here in Australia. So mum wasn't taught street smartness, um, you know, that wise. My nana, my baba nanny just said, Australia's great, beautiful. It's a free country. So she was at the bus stop one day in Newport locally and it was raining. It was a Sunday and this gentleman drove past and said, oh, didn't you know the buses don't run on a Sunday? And then mum said, oh, that's fine, you know, sorry, thanks for telling me. Then he's double bucked around, crime of opportunity, that's what happens. Um, he's turned around and he's double back and he said, oh, by the way, it is raining, wouldn't you like a lift home? She goes, oh, yeah, okay. So she's hopped in his car. Oh, sir, turn left, turn right, and this is my house. And then he just kept going straight. Well, lo and behold, she knew something wasn't right then and there. And... Um, he took it to the country way out in the sticks and then he started, you know, stop the car and she just said, play along, play along. He started to fondle and kiss her and then she just thought, play along, keep, you know, things calm. And then he's turned around to grab a baton, like a steel rod at the back of the car. And th at this time she knew her life was in danger. So she's turned to put her hand on the, the door to run for her life. She said, I'd rather run and be battened to death, not in the car. She would rather try and escape. So at this point, God showed her a vision. Now the vision goes, her getting out of the car, running, and him loving that lustful chase, right? And um, her and battening her to death, right? So God said, stop, don't do that. Turn around and beg for your life. So she turned around and said to the to the guy, please, sir, please, sir, I'm not that type of person. Please, sir, please, sir. Like I'm innocent, she was portraying. And his eyes turned from black, she told me, to innocent, like different. He go, It's like he, he came to. He said, oh, oh, um, sorry, where would you like me to take you? Where would you like me to drop you off? Oh, to the station, sir, please, to the station, sir, please. He drove her to the station, opened the car door and let her out. So, look, unbelievable. So he was possessed as well. And that lust from the fear, um, it, it's so important that we stand in God's love and God's love. And, and God protected my mama. And then as soon as I came to Jesus, she goes, I believe, I believe, because this is what happened to me. Amen. It's so important. When God has his his commandment, his laws, it protects us from the evil one. Amen. And we be. And um when we don't obey him, we are open to the enemy. In that gap, your daughter, something happened to your daughter. She's been since delivered. But this is interesting how you said when you found out you were pregnant, your ex said, Great, because I need that light in you. And then mm -hmm. you something happens to your daughter now she's been delivered but would you mind sharing with us what happened to her yeah so my daughter would at night time when she was at her daddy's house would um get visitations by these big wolf heads with tails she'd tell me so at that time i was new age so you know get the white light archangel michael which most people do that i speak to that's what they believe Oh, and that'll go, you know, white light, you command it in Archangel's name, you know. Nothing ever happened and it would still stay. I pray over her, Archangel Michael. And then she got to the point where she would cling at my leg to go there. She was so scared. And, of course, I told Sean, oh, Tanya, that's just hogwash, you know. You're just molly coddling her, you know. She needs some tough love, you know. I'll leave her alone in the bedroom. She'll be fine. So all of this time she felt rejected, you know. So anyway, she would cling to my leg to go to his house. And then years, she was five up until nine. So four years that wore her down to the point where she just said to me, Mom, I'm exhausted. And I felt in her heart she couldn't do it anymore. It was a whole week without Mama. And he would make sure it was a week with him, week with me and so forth. And I'd all I want was to have her every and just to get let her daddy see her every second weekend because predominantly, you know, he was just tough love, you know, and that was fine. That was how he wanted. But she felt 
But in the end, she got so worn down, so scared of these demonic things coming into her room at night. She, my daughter looked at me in the eyes and I'm consoling her heart. She, I could see she came to the end that I couldn't console her heart anymore. Now, this is dangerous because wherever, when you've been able to do that and then you feel that you're not connected to your child anymore, the world is going to take your child, whether it's going to be substance abuse, whether it's going to be other idol, whatever it will be, um, self-harm. So I knew it was danger. So then and there, I remembered that lady's Jesus, didn't I? I thought I cannot live without my child and my child's being a substance, a victim of narcissism. I couldn't believe that, you know, because sometimes she'd ask for a hug and he'd tell her to F off. Now that's the demon talking, you know, and she'd go, but mummy, you know, all my other friends have a daddy that's present. And um, and we know now since then Sean has apologised to her and he's, he's, you know, I haven't been a very good dad to you and I'm sorry from my upbringing. So that's been profound that he's done that. He's done a lot of healing and he's got a lovely girlfriend now. And so they have a great relationship. So this is not wearing him down or blaming anybody. This is what I want to know. And you can see within me I've got so much love and joy and I love everybody, right? So I want people to know that at this point, and then, and I wasn't a Christian then, but I remembered this client. I remembered her Jesus, how her Jesus helped her when her husband died when she was only 30 and he was only 30. And she had this peace. And I just remembered falling to the ground. It was in my land room in Mini Ponds. And I just remembered falling to the ground. And I said, that lady's Jesus. Please help me. Please help me. I can't do life anymore. I came to the end of all my smarts with my daughter, all of my resources I exhausted. And I knew I was at the end of this world thinking I can't help her. And I just knew if that lady's Jesus helped her, and I saw this peace inside of her. And then I said, I need your peace, Jesus. And it was all from my heart. It wasn't words. And I cried and please help me, help me, help me, help me, please. He came into my lounge room. Jesus came in. He had all dressed in white long robe and he picked me up like this. And he rocked me like a mama looks at her newborn baby for the first time. And he looks at me and he goes, I've been wait." He told me in words, I've been waiting for you to come to me since you're a little baby. And he put me to his bosom and oh, from then and there, how can you go from the worst day of your life to the best day of your life? And my, the love that I felt inside, he had, he, he, the kindness that he has, my heart has never felt such tender kindness. And my, then my brain had so much peace. And then I started getting fed liquid love, right? And then all this love was like, if you can imagine having all your veins get filled with love, we have got no idea how much he loves us. And I know he created everyone because you get downloaded so much information when you're near him. And, but it was like I was the only one he created. And it was so intimate and deep. Um, and then I started repenting and I didn't even know I was a sinner prior to that, but I could see my sin near him. And then I said to him, I'm so sorry, because then I could feel myself as a yoga teacher putting puffed up above these people. And, you know, he showed me and I just, I'm so sorry. And then he gave me even more love when I repented. Oh. And then I said, I'm so sorry for pretending walking this life without you. And it's a love affair with Jesus. I want everyone to know he is our first love. He's our bridegroom and he adores us. And um, But this is the thing, right? There will be no tears in heaven, no crying, because when I was in his presence, I even forgot all of what my daughter went through. I even forgot I was a mama. And, and I want to tell the viewers too that there was files that he showed me that they were all, every heartbreak I had, he filed them away and they were filed and he said, I've been there for you, waiting for you. Is this in and heaven? That was, 
Yeah, this was, no, this was when we were intimately there. Oh. I looked up and then he showed me files. It was a flicker of my heart, every heartbreak he's been there. And then through that flicker, guess what he did? He healed. He healed them all. He healed them all, all my heartbreak. And um, my heart has never felt such tenderness and kindness ever. And then the most and what was really important and this is so important to Jesus the truth so after we had that intimate love and how he healed me and now he said I want to tell you the truth and he said this is the proper meaning to the vision that I showed you all those years ago 28 years ago and then he took me up to heaven again and then he showed me the white throne judgment and this time it's not just Father God on his throne. It's Father God on his throne. And it's Jesus standing there like this with his beautiful, so beautiful. He's standing there and in this whole, and it was like he's presented this reenactment of my judgment. And he told me, now, Tanya, this is a reenactment of your judgment day without me. And this is what's going to happen to every soul. So that I'm standing there. And this time the panel of judges again with all the, the golden crowns with the long white robes and Father God's on his throne and heaven is so beautiful and perfect. It's so, and it's the love, the joy, the peace. And this time I'm just standing there. And at this point I didn't fear Father God. I didn't fear God. I, I didn't know what it was like to be a Christian. I didn't know that, you know, he died on the cross for our sins or, you know, anything. So then these books were open in front of these men and they were all looking at me like, oh, so important and exalted. Like this is going to happen to every soul. And this is why like near-death experiences, everyone sees the golden light. Yeah, because you're going to be taken to your judgment. And then that's why people think that they're all going to heaven because they see the white light. But that white light's going to take you to the goodness of God and show you your judgment without Jesus. And this is what I was shown and I need, he told me to warn and tell everybody. And then, so I'm standing there and then these men read out everything I've ever done on earth out of these books. And then everything they would read out and then look and then read out, tell me, read out, look, read out, look. So every time they did that, I sort of dropped down. So the life force, the liquid love that was feeding me up there, because you get so exalted, like it's, it's it's just ecstasy, it's ecstasy like it's giggling you're giggling from joy it's perfection up there so the force that was beating me god was just looking at me with so much love and compassionate admiration and devotion uh and this is what people try and find in relationships here but it's god that has it for us it's that emptiness that he can only fulfill so anyway so with all of this that everything that they're reading out, I lost the life, the life force and I started coming, coming, falling until, guys, I fell to the ground on my knees and I was put on my knees. And then I look up at Jesus and I said, Jesus, I said, what's going on? Because with Jesus, you, you lose, you ask a question, you get an answer in your heart or your mind or in words. It's all different that he uses. And he said, Tanya, he said, this was your judgment day without me and he said your next step is hell and he goes I want you to go and tell everybody that without me that's where you're going and then Jesus put his head down and it was like this and then he spoke to my heart so he used words then and he spoke to my heart he's put his head down and he said Tanya he said nobody takes my word seriously anymore nobody truly follows anymore mm. And then it's like, are you going to be my mouthpiece? And he gently, gently from my heart to his heart told me that. And then I was taken back down to my body. Wait, but okay. So did you mention you saw the rapture up there too, though? Oh, uh, The rapture was another time, another vision that I saw <laughs> when I was crying out to Jesus um, for this is what people got to understand through all the sufferings. We need to come to him and he shows us the truth. Do you know what I mean? And um, so, yeah, I saw the rapture. This is when I was thinking, oh, I was stuck in a sin and I didn't realise it wasn't a sin. 
this is the thing. He loves us when we're innocent. And I was crying out, you know, do I go back to my ex-husband or not? Because there's a lot of people saying that, you know, and the Bible says stay single or be reconciled. So I chose to stay single. But at this time, this is when he showed me the rapture. He showed me, okay, so here's me thinking, should I go back to this ex part, my ex-husband? And he comes after months and months of praying, right? We have to be just so ready. Just keep praying, keep praying. And I never got peace about it and until he showed me, right? So I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and I'm going to brothers, I'm going to sisters. And then this time I just said, no, I just want the word of, I want God to answer me. And then he showed me in a vision, he showed me the trumpet and he showed me a staircase, a glass staircase to heaven. And he said all these saints all of us with long white robes marching up to these staircases to the trumpet and then he said I am your first love I am your husband man focus only on me and don't worry about anything so that was so comforting you know we we got to just focus on the rap you know any day look up your redemption doors near we don't know the day or the hour but we're going to live like it's today that we're going to be taken. And I know, like, I had that little out-of-body experience, what the rapture will feel like. He is so powerful. we just got to understand that he can take us in a split second, like I was taken in that shopping centre. I was spiralled up. That's what the rapture is going to feel like, you know. So what did um, it feel like? It, it was so zoom, like I was speed of light, like I was going straight up. I can't explain it, but there was a force that... um oh, God is amazing, you know, uh, yeah. Wow. You know what? You touched me when you said how Jesus said, nobody takes my word seriously anymore. And that was, you know, that, and I remember you saying that broke your heart. It is heartbreaking because and, word, is the yeah. word is true. And, you know, he loves us so much, but people aren't taking him seriously anymore. Yeah. And look, since then, and, and that's right, and now I'm on my own, the kids have left home, he brings things back to remembrance. And even more so now, I could feel that, you know, with your children and especially your boys, you read their heart more because they're not communicating, they're not able to articulate words. Um, sometimes things are too deep and mothers would know that. you got to read your boy. And I read Jesus like you would read your boy and he he speaks. And this is why we've got to get alone in the quiet place and have that intimate with him because he doesn't reveal that just to anybody and we have to be able to receive that um, and open to receive that. And that's a perfect example of, a, of, a, of your child's love and your boy's love, you know. And, yeah, he did. He put his head down, people, guys, and all viewers, I want you to know that. And he did, and he put his head down, and it was so real to him. It's like you know, he breaks that he, he has his word. There, his that's our stepping stone to heaven. That's love promises that we need to follow him because my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And that's why when I went into churches and I said, you know, and this is the next thing I need to tell people that. You know, I saw another vision of Jesus again and he chastised me because when I was reading his word and Father God says, if you don't forgive, the heavenly Father's not going to forgive you. So here's me not able to forgive my ex at this point. You know, my daughter's, you know, crying not to go and seeing wolf heads in the bedroom and I'm blaming him at this point. And then um, a new Christian of six months, I'm reading, renewing my mind in the word of God, doing everything, sharing my testimony, drawing close to God, and the devil draws, you know, flees from you. And then, um, and I want people to know too, I did see demons in my bedroom at nighttime as soon as I saw that heaven vision through the yoga. So, but in, in any way, going back to the conviction of the forgiveness, um, I would read the word of God and I would have conviction that I need to forgive Sean. And if I don't forgive Sean, the heavenly father said, I'm not going to forgive you. Well, I've already seen heaven. I've seen Jesus. I've been in Jesus's arms. Surely I'm not going to go to hell for unforgiveness, right? This is what my logic said. But then my spirit man was talking to me. Yes, you will. 
So I was double-minded at this point. And this is what we all need to do is work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So this is what that's not taught in the churches. So I went to the churches and I would say to so many churches, to the pastors, please, please help me here. Does God really mean um, I'm going to uh, lose my salvation if I don't forgive Sean? Tanya, Tanya, Tanya. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, um, and my theologian degree says, no, you'll lose your rewards. You you won't. And um, do you think you're earning a salvation then if you think you can lose it? And I said, oh, yeah, that's true. So, Tanya, when you're mature and you don't take Jesus' word seriously, word for word, you'll know that that's fine. You know, you're under grace, not, not under works, lest any man will boast, you know. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's fine. So here's me on my merry way, you know, tit for tat, went to court, took my daughter off my son, well, off her dad, you know, for three months. You know, because she was, you know, sad being there, seeing the wolf herds. I needed to protect her one week here, one week there, justifying my sin, right? So then this is, I was still praying, still sharing his testimony with everybody. And, um, but I did feel that, you know, something was not right, but I couldn't pinpoint it. See how I went to churches and asked for confirmation. But then three o'clock in the morning, Father God visited me, right? Mm -hmm. And the whole of heaven come to my bedroom, the walls vanished, and that's it. And I was called up to the throne of God again. Now, guys, everyone needs to know, we can be called up there anytime. And um, why was I called up? Why was I disciplined? I don't know. But I know I was deceived, and I seriously thought that I was still going to heaven. And Jesus does, Father God chastises the ones he loves. So anyway, and I was doing the itching ears. You know how the Bible talks about I was seeking out, you know, preachers to tell me what I wanted to hear. So anyway, at this point, I didn't fear Father God um, at all. And when we talk about fear, it's not like you live totally in fear. You fear your flesh. You fear obeying your heart. <laughs> you rely on his promises and his commandments. And he doing the Father's will, not your own will. That's what we fear. We fear coming away listening to our own will. And it's only those, don't call me Lord, Lord, at the end of your life if you don't do the Father's will. That's what Jesus says. Many are going to call, come to me on that day and profess that they are entitled to heaven and he'll go, be gone. I never knew you, you evildoers, because he never knew you. You didn't come to him working out. Please help me. I can't forgive him. But what I did was wrong. I didn't come to Jesus and this is a very important point that people need to know I justified my sin I didn't come to Jesus for help to overcome this sin and what happened next is so profound and it changed my whole walk and more intimate with Jesus and held that intimate connection with Jesus um and that's why a lot of walks go up and down because they need to know that they need to have the fear of the Lord to depart from from iniquity. So anyway, so the throne of God comes and meets me three o'clock in the morning. So at this point, Sean hasn't seen his daughter for three months. I was in and out of court doing the normal thing, what you do with your narcissist sex, yeah, custody battle. So anyway, um, yeah, so God speaks. And I don't know if it was Jesus or Father God, but just after years have gone by, I believe it was the Father. And he says to me, you need, Tanya, you need to forgive Sean. And I go, we're used to justifying things with relationships and negotiating, aren't we? So I said, oh, but Sean's done this list of things wrong and I've done this list of things wrong, you know? Silence. And then Father God says, you're not teaching your daughter to honour her father. And I go, what is there to honour? Like, you know, he's not been, he swears, you know, he's not been a really good dad. Silence. And then this time I just thought, oh, okay, I'm getting my way. That's good. Straight away his cloak, because he had a big long white gown that came down to the floor on his throne. I saw that gown being taken like he was had enough of me, taken, and all the goodness, and I felt myself falling into hell falling, falling, falling. But the shock, the shock of going to hell and feeling discarded and casted away from, from Father God, from God, 
all the goodness, all the love, everything taken out from you. I can't, I can't, my words, my words can't even say. And it was only like a couple of seconds and he knows that I wouldn't have been able to mentally take any more. I would have been totally, you know, you know, hospitalised. Like I even, I had a nervous breakdown seeing what I saw anyone. I had to go on medication and I had to go into the bath and release my legs from, I couldn't stop my whole body continuously convulsing. Um, and I knew, because when you're in, in hell, you, you get all information as well. When you can't, you, when you're in the spirit with God, you, you know, you get all the information. You need to forgive Sean. And if you don't, you're going here. This is where you're going. Um, it's a, it, it, are you going to forgive him? Absolutely. Instantly, I had so much compassion for Sean. And instantly it was three in the morning I had to wait it was the longest hours of my life three four five six until it would dawn until I could ring him and beg for his forgiveness and say please wherever you are I'm dropping your daughter to you and that was my way out of hell and I'm telling you now if we don't forgive the heavenly father is not going to forgive us I rang Sean we were in court it's amazing he even picked up the phone he said Tanya he goes are you okay you sound really scared I go yes I saw hell last night for not forgiving you not sent you know keeping your daughter away from you for three whole months I'm so so sorry he goes yes Tanya I haven't seen her for three months it really hurt me and I said oh I am I just kept I didn't even defend I just kept saying I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and he humbled he goes Tanya are you okay I said look can I come and see you now and I'll give you Sanisha he goes I'm up on a roof I'm a roof plumber I said, I'll come to your work right now. He, I said, is that okay? He goes, yeah, absolutely. As soon as I couldn't get there quick enough, I saw him. I gave him the biggest hug. I said, Sanisha, she listened to me. Yeah, sure, Mum, I'll go with Dad. We are held accountable for what we teach our children. We are held accountable to what we do in this body that God has given us. And if we say we're a Christian, oh, we need to forgive. Anyway, so I'm holding him we're crying I'm crying and you know what he said to me he said Tanya he says your eyes are so different he goes you're so kind now can you please stay like this and you know what he said to me we were in a custody battle one week on one week off he was going for full custody I was going for full custody and you know what he said to me he goes Tanya how many days do you want your daughter wow wow yeah and then from that day, we've had peace. And I said, oh, really? I would love her. I was too scared to say I should have said more. No. <laughs> and that was 14 years ago. And till this day, we've had peace. And he's apologised to his girl. And what it is, we need to believe. We need to forgive. And we need to believe the best in people and give people. That's what mercy is. We don't judge them on what they've done to us. We turn the other cheek. And that is the child of God. We do not fight. We do not bring justice on this earth. We allow the Father. He's the judge. And um, saith the Lord, I will judge. Revengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We need to do those scriptures. And um, it's so hard because in the suffering, we, we get so hurt and we follow our flesh. We follow our heart. And this is where we will decide, are we a Christian going to heaven or are we on our way to Satan dragged to hell? And like I was explaining before, the enemy is the enemy. And um, ever since then, my my daughter has, you know, we've got peace in our family now. The curse is not on us. Um, the way that we treat our relationships, we're going to be judged on. And we, we don't know that, though. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so we need to bring the personal life to Jesus and he will fight for us. But we need to do it his way, or else we, uh, the enemy is allowed to touch our children. Like my daughter was being attacked at night time, and I hear a lot of my clients tell me there's a lot of demonic attacks through their children, mm -hmm. and they call it sleep paralysis. They they label it as all of that. Do you know what I mean? They give it medical yeah. terms. Yes. To demonic. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so how is your daughter now? Because I know your daughter went through a lot. You know how you said she didn't want to be here anymore and she went through a lot. How is she now? 
so good now. She has got so much, you know, peace and joy. Well, she hasn't come to the Lord and, you know, the Lord will work on her heart, but she's living in Mexico now and she's found peace within herself. And her daddy's apologised to her and they have a great relationship. Is it perfect? No, nothing's perfect, but it is in God's eyes because, you know, we're doing it God's ways. And if the parent is following God, even just one parent, that really matters, you know, because that can bring peace to the whole family because it takes two to argue and to fight. And there's a lot of single broken families now, and this is why this is so important to get out there as well, isn't it? That's so true. And you yeah. know what? This is amazing too because you saw how the Lord, Jesus Christ, is changing a narcissist because it's been said that a narcissist cannot change. They're like the forever. There's no hope. But because of your faithfulness to the Lord, your prayers, your trust and your obedience, you've seen a turnaround in your ex-husband. We're oh, no longer showing as much narcissism as he did before. Yes. And he's found love. And, you know, um, whether he, he's not with the Lord yet, but it's brought peace in our circumstances. But what I'm saying is it brings death and destruction to the home. Um, and we've got so much peace from that. And um, I can't explain, you know, enough how important it is to follow Jesus in this life and for the afterlife. But the afterlife with Jesus is just so amazing. Do you know what I mean? Like the love that Jesus has in heaven is profound, more than our own understanding. And he does have a place for us. It's beyond our understanding, the love that he has for us, the devotion. We just have to, by faith, follow him, by faith, believe and, and obey him as Lord, not us be the Lord of our own lives, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You said something interesting to me the other day too. You said that had you had been left with the very first vision of heaven, what would have happened? Because I, we were speaking and we were talking about how I think last year or maybe the year before we had um, a video or an interview of someone who gave a testimony of how the enemy does false NDEs or false near-death experiences. And a lot of people think that, you know, they're going to heaven, like you said early, because they see a light and all that thing. So could you explain what God showed you had you only been left with that very first vision of heaven when you were at the shopping mall? I mean, it's so important that, you know, if we don't get the full truth, and this is why he told me that he needs me to explain hell is real without him, I would have gone into the new age. And this is why a lot of the the even the elite are going to be deceived in the last days. And um, there is a lot of false visions as well, you know. I would have definitely been so deceived all the way to hell believing that. I want people to know that even if you've seen visions and dreams, you've interpreted it through a new age way, it, Jesus will even show himself to near-death experiences. But beyond that light, beyond that, is your judgment, that white throne judgment that I saw. And then without following Jesus, and those books are recording everything that you've ever done with those golden crowns. There's, there's courtrooms, 24 elders on the 24 thrones. and But he does not want us to go there. But we need to seek hunger and thirst for righteousness. He will give you more. He gives you a little bit, but then it's up to us to keep coming back and then he'll give you more. But if he sees you're sincere because he only gives grace to the humble, he does not give grace to the prideful. So the suffering, I give honour to the suffering I went through because without that, I was too successful in life. I was too prideful in life, but thinking I was a good person, everyone loved me, but I was on my way to hell. And then I thank my, my brother for warning me. And this is why now there's a little seeds that the Jesus can use. And this is what Jesus is wanting me to do is seed people. So before you die, if you're dying in a car accident, do not die without Jesus. You ask for all your heart, everything for forgiveness. And those sins are all washed away. And then you go sin no more and you come walk with him. So that thief on the cross, if he died, he asked for forgiveness and he was sincere. He got paradise but if that thief had to come down and walk with jesus and walk a lifetime with jesus and still live 
he still had to turn from his sin and follow Jesus and love everyone, forgive everyone. So this is what people say, I don't have to do anything. No, you don't. But you've got to turn from your evil and follow him. We need to forgive to be forgiven. And there is first, first Corinthians 6.9, Galatians 5.19, there's sins that we need to stop fornicating. We need to stop swearing, drinking, and these are going to defile our garments. Jesus said, you know, you're my unspotted bride, you know, waiting for the bridegroom's wedding, you know, the wedding feast, you know. Amen. And you know what? You express, Amen. and I see it, and I don't know if those watching right now see it as well. You have such a joy for the Lord, a love for him, and a love for people. Um, now, if anyone yeah. wanted to reach out to you, Tanya, to speak to you more, to connect, how can they do that? Um, uh, you can reach me on my YouTube channel and the links are below, um, on my, uh, my email as well and my Facebook. They are all the links are below. And please reach out any questions that you've got to, uh, to ask or just anything, prayer or because I really want to build up this ministry now. My children have left home and I want to do what the Lord wants me to do. And Amen. You and you will. And could you do us a favor? Could you pray for everyone watching right now? Um, because yes. there are people who are like, I want this Jesus now, or I'm in the Lord, but I feel like I'm not there. Maybe I'm a religious spirit. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just not where I'm supposed to be, but I want to be right. I don't want to go to hell. Like, you know, the Lord showed Tanya, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to be uh, at the great white throne judgment. I want to be right with the Lord. So could you just pray for our audience right now? Amen. Thank you, heavenly father. Thank you, Jesus for everything that you've done in my life. And thank you, Jesus, for every soul that's going to hear your words spoken through me, Lord God. Please humble everyone's heart. Give them ears to hear and a heart to hear. Father God, the white throne judgment is real. You don't want anyone to go there, Father God. You want souls to come to your kingdom of heaven. Father God, it, Anyone that hears this message and you want to get right with God, you just go with all your heart in the secret place that no one can hear. Close your eyes and find that secret place with all your heart and you pray, please, Jesus, in your own words, forgive me. I don't want to do life anymore without you. I don't want to do life on my own. I don't want to pretend I'm okay. I don't. I want that emptiness gone. I want you to come and live inside of me. I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want you to show me how to be born again. I want to sh you to show me how to walk this life uh, hand in hand with you. Born again, it's a new walk. You renew your mind and you live differently to do the Father's will. Father God, it's a choice that everyone needs to make, that you give us all free will, that we will come to you on our own. Father God, thank you. Jesus is not. Please, viewers, I want you to know that you don't have to play these religious prayers. Just pray from all your heart and he writes your name in the book of life. There is a book of life and if your name's not written in the book of life, you can't go to heaven. And Jesus is the one, the Lamb's book of life. And it's the good news, but you need to know the bad news before. Amen. Tanya Ward, I just want to thank you so much for um, being with us today. Thank you so much for this testimony. And again, if anyone wants to reach Tanya, it's everything is in a description below. And Tanya, once again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for everything and your time. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me and um, for all your viewers to listen. Praise Jesus. Yeah. Amen. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, Pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.